morning's scripture lesson is Luke 7, 1 through 10. If you'd like to follow in the Pew Bible, it's in the New Testament, page 61. I'll be reading from the New International Version. And this uh, passage is known as the faith of the centurion. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his ma uh, master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority. With soldiers under me, I tell one to go, and he goes. And that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the man who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us pray. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our thoughts and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. Unless you speak, nothing of significance will be spoken. Give us your word, Lord Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> When you board a plane, you have no idea what can happen. Max Lucado says she nearly missed the flight. <clears throat> I thought I had the whole road to myself. And then I looked up, I saw her puffing down the aisle and dragging two large bags. She sat down and said, I hate to fly. I put getting here as long, off as long as I can. And, and I said to her, well, you almost put it off too long and missed the flight. She was tall, young, blonde, and very talkative. Her jeans were fashionably ripped at the knees. Her black boots boasted silver tips. She really did hate to fly, and the way she coped with flying was by talking a lot. <clears throat> I'm going to see my dad. He's really amazed at my tan. He thinks I'm crazy living in California, being single and all. I've got this new boyfriend. He's from a different country. He travels a lot, though, so I only see him on the weekends, which is fine with me because he gives me the house to myself. It's not far from the beach, and, and she kept going. I've learned what to do when a friendly, attractive woman sits beside me. As soon as I am able, I reveal my profession and my marital status. It keeps us both out of trouble. My wife hates to fly too, I said. So I know how you feel. And since I'm a preacher, I know a section of the Bible you might like to read as we take off. <clears throat> I pulled out my Bible, I opened it to Psalm 23, and for the first time, she was quiet. <laughs> Praise God. The Lord is my shepherd, she read the words, and then looked up with a broad smile. I remember this. I, I read it when I was young. A and she read some more, but the next time she looked up, there was a tear in her eye. And she said, it's been a long, long, long time. She told me she once believed. She became a Christian when she was young, but she couldn't remember the last time she'd been to church. And we talked about faith and second chances. I asked her if I could ask a question. She said, sure. And so I asked, do you believe in heaven? Well, yeah. Do you believe you'll be there? And she thought for a moment, and then she said, yeah, 
yeah, I'll, I'll be in heaven. H how do you know that? She grew quiet as she formulated her response. Somehow I knew what she was going to say before she said it. I could see it coming. <clears throat> she was going to give me her list. Everybody has one. Well, I'm basically good. I don't smoke more than a pack a day. I exercise. I'm dependable at work. And she counted each achievement on a finger. And then she said, oh, and, and I made my boyfriend get tested for AIDS. Ta-da! That was her list. Her qualifications. <clears throat> By her way of thinking, heaven is earned by good health habits and dependability. Her line of logic was simple. Keep the list on earth and get the place you have in heaven. Max says everybody has a list. What's on yours? I pay my bills, love my family, <clears throat> attend church, I'm better than most bad people. I'm basically good. Most people have a list. And, and its purpose is to prove that we are good, that our lives have merit. But the difficulty is this. In the kingdom of which we are a part, and the kingdom which we serve, goodness is not the password. Nor is goodness the qualification. The list is not enough. There comes a time when we must put down our goodness and reach out for God's help. To, to recognize that there is just such a limit to what we are able to do, to the things that we can accomplish, to the things that we can just make happen or bring about, <coughs> including our own personal levels of goodness, and take our hands and reach out to God for help. There are some people who approach Jesus with news of a centurion who has a servant that is gravely ill. These good people have come to Jesus because the centurion has sent them to seek out the only help that is left for him, the man of miracles, the man named Jesus. It's interesting that rather than just asking Jesus for help, <clears throat> that the group that comes makes a case for the centurion by bringing their own list. You see, you thought it was a new thing. They give a list that speaks to his goodness and his kindness. Though in league with the Romans, the centurion has helped get a Jewish temple built. That's on the list. He is known for trying to do good things, for having compassion and kindness in his heart, for loving all people, but especially those of Jewish descent. And he is known for being basically a very good man. <clears throat> his servant is sick and dying. Please come. And so Jesus goes with them, not because of the list, but because God does not turn a deaf ear to human need. And, and if you remember nothing else that's said today, I want you to remember that. God never turns a deaf ear to human need. <clears throat> As they make their way to his home, it becomes apparent to the centurion that his request will do some difficult things for Jesus. A Jewish holy man coming into the house of a centurion will defile Jesus in the eyes of the people. What place Jesus holds in their eyes will suffer the moment he steps inside the home of this centurion. And you may as well put the picture in the newspaper and let the mudslinging begin. For the moment that Jesus steps into the house of a Gentile, he will lose credibility with some segments of the population. And we understand that concept, don't we? Don't we see it alive and well in our own world? 
<clears throat> the political world uses it all the time, painting images of candidates created with half-truths and lifted up by design to make people think less of certain candidates because of a word spoken, because of something said, and have mercy because of things that they may have done along the way. Why are we so easily led to things that by design try to make us think less of people even when they are candidates? Why are we so easily led by such dribble and character assassination rather than demanding that real issues and solutions be addressed? I want to see a political campaign and a political world where not one single time do you point at the person and what they've done or what they've said. I want to hear solutions. I want to hear plans. I want to hear what we're going to see done. And I don't want to be the kind of person that because I read it in the newspaper, I automatically believe it. We're familiar with it. It's how the world works. <clears throat> we see it in local newspapers when people and circumstances are brought into our field of vision, inspiring us to think the worst of others instead of thinking about grace and understanding and how can we help them in their moments of need. Why is it that we believe the worst about people in a given moment. And when we see somebody's picture on television or we see their picture in the newspaper, we automatically set for, in, in stone for life, for many of us, what we think of that situation or what we think of that person. Shame on us. The people who follow a God who believes in second chances, who says that grace is extended to every human being in need, and yes, everybody makes mistakes and everybody sins. It doesn't mean life is over. And shame on us when we're better at judging than helping. We see it all the time in the reality of gossip, which the Bible says is a sin, by the way, even though we say, bless their hearts. <clears throat> Why is it that we run to that so quickly? Is it because we love information? Maybe. You see, we see it in blogs and emails all the time. People giving everything that they think and floating their opinion as gospel, sometimes bullying people in their writings because it's far easier to push someone around when you don't have to look them in the eye. Sometimes people who do that <clears throat> remind me of the parable of the firefly. Do you know that parable? Seems there's a little firefly who flies around jumping up and down, straining and moaning and groaning and pushing and... Yeah, believing that he is giving light to the whole world. And all he's really doing is showing his backside. That's what happens in our world, friends. What happened to seeking God's mind and God's wisdom and God's vision for people? What happened? Jesus doesn't seem to worry about that. He's on the way. The centurion who is thinking about it sends word to Jesus, don't come. I understand power and authority because I'm a commander of people. <clears throat> if you will simply speak the word from a distance, speak the word from where you are, I know he'll be well. Just speak the word, please, Lord. And Jesus stops in his tracks because never has he seen such great faith in all of Israel. Not among his own people or any other for that matter. This is the greatest demonstration of faith that Jesus has seen. And he says so. The centurion understands the greatness of God. And the power of God. Do you? I always wondered why my mother required us to kneel when we said our prayers every night. 
<clears throat> we did our best to tell her, Mama, it's fine if we're lying on our backs in our bed or over here in the chair. And, but that was not my mom. Mm -mm. She just smiled and gave us more information than we wanted. When you gave my mama a reason, she gave you several reasons to think otherwise. She always did that. She told us that when we kneel by our beds, it's like kneeling at the altar in church. She said we were actually making our beds an altar. We get on our knees not because God expects it, but because it helps us to know the greatness of God. To look up. And when we kneel and bow our heads and hearts before God, it changes our view of who God is. And so we would kneel every night by our bed and we were taught to pray. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray thee, Lord, my soul you'll take. Every night. Every night, no matter how early or late, no matter how tired or troubled, we would kneel by our bedside and pray. And I believe that to this day, I see God in His greatness because I had a mother who taught me to kneel and give a piece of my heart and soul to this great God of heaven and earth. We prayed with reverence. Never did we say, hey God, me again. Hey God, just checking in always with reverence as we knelt before God. And when my mother passed from this life to the next, and I was granted the privilege to be with her, and I, I've thought about that a lot today. In that moment when I did not know what to do, when she, she's gone, I knelt by her bed in that hospital room, all alone, and said, Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. You see, Mother's Day is always special to me. I, I cannot pray in comfort without kneeling at my bedside or at this altar. And I want my son to know the greatness of God. So I am teaching him to kneel. Stay tuned. Because there's something powerful in doing that. In kneeling, it shows where we're placing our faith and trust in the greatness of God. I, I don't understand <clears throat> why some people put their faith in other people because people will always let us down. I don't really understand why people put faith in money because the goal for life really isn't money and plenty of it and whoever said that was absolutely wrong. And nowhere in scripture does that indicate that that's the goal as far as God is concerned for our lives. Some folks put their faith in luck or fate or superstitions. They judge life's goodness by random happenings that have nothing to do with God whatsoever. Some people put faith in themselves, and that's a bad bill of goods. Some people put their faith in their children. We're to invest expectations in children our faith in God. Too often today, children have struggles with a relationship to God because mom and dad don't model it. The church cannot give that to children. It's a parental job. We are called to give them guidance, expectations, Christian understanding, we're to teach them because we have faith in God. We are not to have faith in them. We are to teach them and guide them. I had parents, I guess, who understood that. You know, when I went off to college, my father made me turn my house key in. <coughs> 
he, he said to me, we want you to come home as often as you want to come home, but we want you to call first so we know you're on the way. Come as often as you will. They taught, they taught me that we're glad you're going to college. You're going to help pay for it. That means you're going to work and go to school at the same time because, you know, making a living and making a life takes work. And when you get a car, it will be yours because you'll buy it. And I did. You know, I wasn't real grateful in those days for those decisions. But I am now. Yeah. I am now. Some folks put their faith in the church, and that's a bad plan. The reason is simple. The church isn't perfect, and it is subject to the whims and spirits of those who make it up. Too often we act like church is a place, but church is a people. Our faith, let me say it again, is to be in God. In God. In God. You're not supposed to determine what you think of God by what you think of me or Jonathan or any other preacher. You're not supposed to look at me to formulate what you think about Christianity or about God or Jesus Christ. You're supposed to work on a relationship that allows you to know who Christ is, to know what He did for you on the cross, and to develop your own relationship with Him, a relationship that is best expressed in humility, the kind of humility that binds us together as a family, and that we give gratitude every time we gather in this place to be the people of God that we're grateful that God is always here to be with us and for us and to help us and to strengthen us. That's a far cry from people who get mad because their name was wrong in the bulletin. Or I wasn't humbly recognized for my service. Or somebody didn't call and check on me. Or I have not been asked to be the soloist. Faith is about where you put your trust. Not how well we wear our humanity. We're supposed to enjoy our relationships in and through the church, but our trust and faith is to be in God. When's the last time we did that? That we raised our hands saying, Father, help. When's the last time we came into this place and recognized that He comes and He sits directly beside us in this worship service and He speaks to our hearts, to our points of need, to our hurts, to our questions, to our doubts, to everything? How long has it been since we realized that? He is present in this place this morning. For all of us. Ready to speak the word that our hearts need to hear. And so I need to ask as we conclude our time together. Where do you place your trust? Where do you place your faith? I choose today, now, and forever. God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.